So, um, so I want to welcome Dr. Glover to the call, and, and I look forward to having him at the Integrated Man Summit in Miami. And for those of you that haven't attended the Integrated Man Summit, this is the second one. And the idea behind it is we really want, we don't want to just fill it up with a ton of different speakers as so much as we want to fill it up with speakers we really like and enjoy listening to that, that mean a lot. Um, so we really usually only have one or two uh, speakers outside the company that, and then they get the chance to speak every day, um, three days of the event. So they could, you really get a chance to know them and talk to them between the, the, the events. Now, Dr. Glover has an impact on me that goes back before I ever even got into the um, uh, dating community. I didn't even know it existed when I found your book. And um, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know it either when I wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> it all built up around that, yeah. Um, I found your book, I was, I was living in Long Beach, dating, I was in a relationship, and I read that book, and like probably a million times you've heard, I got triggered up the wazoo. I was so triggered. So much to me, emotions and feelings and realizations, one after another. And I remember coming home to my girlfriend, and I, I, some the nice guy turned off, and I started yelling at her and got mad at her and all this stuff. And then, I, then of course, I felt guilty and ashamed. Of course. And uh, then I pulled out the book and showed her, and she laughed. She was so great about it. She just laughed, thought it was funny, and that I, that she got it. She loved that I was reading the book, and she really appreciated it. Um, but that began my journey and my search. I, I ended up uh, in this yoga community for a bit, and then I found dating material. And then I just, what I realized is I grew, because I was already working as a hypnotherapist, working with a lot of uh, weight loss people, and noticing the deep level of codependence and all the weight loss and structure behind it. And then reading your book and seeing the similarities in some ways, and, and how much I just had to keep reading it and highlighting it over and over that that this is the core of, of men today. You really are talking to a core group of, a huge group of men, at least in the Western uh, uh, world. And it's almost shocking. Um, and it makes me ponder what men were like 200 years ago compared to today. Yeah. And so I wanna uh, welcome you for being here. Now, if anybody hasn't read his book, get his book. It's called No More Mr. Nice Guy. You, they can go to uh, your website, nomoremrniceguy.com. Yeah, go to Amazon, go to, doc go to drglover.com. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, easiest way to find me or just, just Google no more Mr. Nice Guy. I even beat out Alice Cooper for about the top 10 spots. So Nice. That, that's awesome. Um, and I've been recommending your book for over 10 years, may, telling everybody to read it. I've probably, I don't know how many copies I've probably got <laughs> sold well, for you. Thank you. you. You probably furnished my office. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> that's possible. That's possible. So, um, so let's, let's dig in. Um, um, let's just break it down for those people on the phone that are wondering if they're a nice guy, you know, what is the nice guy, you know, and, and uh, let's, let's just dive right into that. And that's, that's a good place to start. Yeah. Um, basically uh, just to break it completely down, a nice guy is somebody who's internalized a belief that they're not okay, just as they are. And we, we can kind of break that down further. How, how, how we do that, how we do it as children, as babies to so start internalize that belief that there's something wrong with us. And then out of that belief develops a, a paradigm, a roadmap, a defense mechanism, a survival skill, whatever we want, we want to call it, of trying to be what we believe other people want us to be in order to, to be approved of, to be liked, to be loved, to get our needs met, and hide anything about us that we, might, that we think might get a negative reaction from people. So basically, a nice guy is a person out there, you know, chameleon, you know, holding his finger up, testing the air, see which way the wind's blowing, and then going that way. And um, as, as I'm sure we're going to dive deeper into, this causes all kinds of problems for the nice guy himself, but also for the people around him. And, you know, whether it means uh, family, loved ones, friends, workplace. Uh, it, it just doesn't work real well when you spend your life trying to figure out what you think other people want you to be and trying to hide anything you think might get a negative reaction. Yeah. And that's pretty much how I spend my life. Um, um, why do you, when you look at nice guys, it, it intrigues me. Um, well, first off, I spent my life trying to figure out how to please everybody thinking that would make life happy. The way I talk about it is I want to get rid of all the tension out of the environment. And if there's no tension, everybody's gonna be happy, which is actually the opposite of true. You know, we go to the movies to experience tension. To go on a yeah, road. We, we watch a sporting event to experience tension. Yeah, nice yeah. guys do a lot of um, 
it seems very intuitive to the nice guy himself. I'm a recovering nice guy as well. That's how I know this stuff. But a lot of stuff we do um, is the opposite of, of really what works. And then we think it should work, so we keep doing more of it, doing that whole insanity routine. But one of the things that kind of helps people really get a, a real grasp on this is something I call covert contracts. And a lot of people told me that's one thing in the book that, that really resonated the most and helped them see their patterns. But nice guys, I break it down, that nice guys tend to operate by three covert contracts. They're all if-then propositions. And, and they're all kind of like contracts with the world, with, with, with women, with just, you know, whatever. Covert contract number one is that if I'm a good guy, I'll be liked and loved. Uh, and, and especially women will want to sleep with me. And you know, probably you tried this and a lot of people we work with try it. I call it nice guy seduction. Well, if I'm just really nice to women and hide my sexual agenda, listen to them talk about their problems, volunteer to help them do things. If I'm different from the other bad men I've heard them complain about, then they'll like me, love me and want to get naked with me. And yeah. as we've all found out, it doesn't work. It puts you in the friend zone, but that's a maybe if you're lucky. Um, so covert contract number one, if, if I just um, am a good guy, I'll be liked and loved. Covert contract number two is that if I meet everybody else's needs without them having to ask, then they will meet my needs without me having to ask. And again, uh, this is another covert contract that doesn't work. Number one, nobody else knows about the contract. We're trying to guess at what other people's needs are, and we're giving them kind of what we need to give them, not what they need to receive. And then assuming they'll read our minds as well, and they'll give back to us without us having to ask. Well, of course, a lot of times people don't even know the contract exists. They don't know what it is we need. And to top it off, we nice guys are terrible receivers. We actually make it hard for people to give to us, and we don't usually give to ourselves very well as either, very well either. Third covert contract is if I do everything right, I'll have a smooth, problem-free life. And that's kind of like that, you know, no anxiety yeah. thing you're talking about. If I do everything right, well, number one, where's the rule book for doing everything right? You know, I don't know. I, a few people have written a book and they said, this is the rule book, you know, mm -hmm. do everything. But even in those rule books, they usually say, all fall short of the glory of God. All are sinners. You know, you can't do it right. So, but we think, oh, if I do everything right, then nothing will ever go wrong in my life. You know, my, my, my girlfriend will never get mad at me. My boss will never fire me. You know, I'll never get audited by the IRS. I'll never get a flat tire. The world doesn't work that way. But, co but nice guys believe those three covert contracts should get them everything they want in life, should get them liked and loved, it should get their needs met, and it should get them that calm, free, problem-free life that they've been striving for since they were like three weeks old. Uh, it's funny it's, when you say all that, that calm, free, problem, free life they're striving for it. And if they got it, they would be so unhappy anyways, because I just don't think men are built to be unchallenged. We, as soon as we, we're unchallenged, living in a challenge free world, we're bored. Yeah. You know? it, my wife tells me that all the time. She said, you know, she said, if I wasn't like the ocean, if I wasn't changing every time, you'd get bored with me. Should have, she'll say, if I wasn't crazy, you'd get bored with me. And I, said, well, I, I, I can't argue with that. And, and you're right. I believe, and, and I think, you know, I, I love going into these subjects about the things that men are struggling with nowadays, all the way from incels to MGTOW to, you know, uh, all the things that men are having difficulty with, uh, even being drawn into like, you know, white nationalism and neo-Nazi stuff. And, and I think a lot of that is, is that um, we, we've not been taught how, how to deal with challenge. We haven't had our initiation. We don't have tribe. Um, and so we're just kind of lost floating in the nursery, just, you know, seeking validation of safe women, surfing the internet, jacking off to porn. Um, trying to figure out technology, <laughs> uh, watching television, smoking dope, drinking. And, it, and it's like, yeah, it doesn't bring out the best in men. We kind of just degenerate into, into male stupidity um, and nothingness when we don't have challenge. But here's, the, here's kind of the, the paradox for us men. We men are at our best when challenged. And we rise to the occasion. We solve the problem. We conquer the enemy. You know, we get the girl. And then we want to just kick back and relax. It's done. 
You know, oh, you know, I, I conquered that enemy. Well, the enemy doesn't stay conquered. Well, I solved that problem. Well, problems don't stay solved. Well, I got that woman. Well, women don't stay content with. So, we, then, we, then, and then we, then we whine and we complain. Now, we, 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 we need a sense of initiation. That says this is the world. This is life. It's challenging. Let's let's welcome that. Let's dance with it. Let's you know let's let's lean into it and do it with our brothers and do it with skill sets that work well for us instead of just hanging out in the manosphere or going online and whining and complaining about how badly, you know, all the women out there have treated me. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't okay. serve us well. It doesn't serve us at all. I see a lot of men that do that. They, uh, or they try to do that, you know, take retirement, for example, a man retires the moment he retires, uh, he starts getting bored. He starts atrophying. He starts, you know, slowing down and, Men that live a long time, I find, tend to keep themselves challenged. They don't retire. If they retire from one job, they start something else. Sure. They don't just go to the garage and start building birdhouses waiting to die, which is uh, kind of the metaphor for a lot of guys today. It's like, what do I do now? Well, you, you relax. Well, men aren't built for that. We're, meant, we're built to, 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 it's like bodybuilding. We're built to step in and build a little more each day, create yeah. a little more each day. That's where we get our sense of purpose, right? I, I agree. I mean... Uh... I'm 63. My dad retired at 55 and I'm thinking, well, I mean, he had a blue collar job. He didn't love it. My job is not physically strenuous, but I love it. And you know, people, I live in a retirement type community here in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And people all the time ask when I'm retired and I kind of like, what's that? Um, yeah. I, if, if I, if I retired, I would just keep writing books. Well, that's what I do. So why would I retire from it? You know, I, I'll just, as long as my brain holds up, why wouldn't I keep wanting it to be challenged? I'm, my, my wife doesn't speak English. Um, and so here I am, you know, I started in my late fifties to early sixties, learning to a foreign language and learning how to live in a foreign country and communicate. So yeah, why, why would I quit looking for challenges? Yeah, I agree with that hundred percent. I always say there's different degrees uh, there's men out there who are nice guys who get all their attention from movies, sitting in a comfortable theater with the air conditioner, eating popcorn, drinking a soda, watching James Bond kick everybody's ass. Yeah. For a week, he wants to go out and learn karate, and then he forgets. Then you got your weekend warriors who are out playing basketball, and then you got the people that are traveling the world and living full lives till the day they die, like Warren Buffett, people like this who are doing what they love till the day they die. Uh, Richard Branson, they can be 80 years old, and they're still out there uh, providing value back to the world, when, and the world loves them for it. And, and this is what I love. And what I find with the nice guys that really saw this in your book and was really powerful was that you were talking a lot about uh, toxic shame. And I, I, you know, I, I had learned before I even read your book about toxic shame from Bradshaw. Right. Now, that's shame, shame that's is, where I learned about it. Yeah. Amazing, amazing work. And uh, shame is really at the core of it. Is, is it not? Well, yes. Well, I, I hesitate for a moment because when I wrote No More Mr. Nice Guy, and I, and I finished writing it over 20 years ago and it came out in 2003. And as I, as I explored, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a systems analyst. I'm a problem solver. I like to figure out why things work, why they don't and what makes them that way. And as I looked at nice guy syndrome and looked at my own life and the men I'd worked with shame really stood out to where um, that, that trying to become something other than what I am trying to hide you know, from what I am from other people, that, that tends to be a shame-based behavior. And toxic shame is, is just a core internalized emotional belief. I'm not okay just as I am. There's something wrong with me. I'm unlovable. And I, I remember my, my second wife introduced me to John Bradshaw and the concept of shame. And I remember her reading me, you know, some, some stuff out of his books. And she said, well, that, that's just like you. And I'm, and I'm, I'm a fairly intelligent guy. I had a PhD at that time in marriage and family therapy. And, and it really, at first I had, I couldn't even grasp the concept of shame and, and, and I couldn't really even see how it applied to me. Well, I was an unrecovered nice guy, but what I'd done, I just put it in such a tight compartment and then spent so much of my life trying I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Look at me. Choose me. I'm good. I'm good. I do it all right. And everything that didn't fit that I tucked it away in this little compartment. And, and so it took me a while really for, for the shame, for the idea of shame to sink in. And then after writing the book, I've had a number of people say, you know, thank you. Your description of toxic shame in your book was so helpful and so enlightening. I thought, good, I must have finally gotten it and understood it to write it. So I believe 
and I say no more, Mr. Nice Guy, that, that Nice Guy Syndrome is, is fundamentally a shame-based disorder. Now, I've added to that in, in the 20 plus years since I finished writing No More Mr. Nice Guy, I've really also come to see a very second, a second very powerful dynamic, and that's anxiety. That Nice Guy Syndrome also tends to be an anxiety-based disorder. Of everything nice guys do is around trying to manage anxiety, trying to get it right, not make mistakes, yeah. not fail, not get their shame triggered, not have somebody be mad. Oh. So really you've got both of those things at interplay with most nice guys, whether they're conscious or not. Is that shame? I'm not good enough. And anxiety that, oh no, I'm in trouble. So would you say that it goes basically, because the way I look at it is at the, beneath the shame is probably abandonment. We talk about, you talk about that sure. a lot in the book. You got the core abandonment, then it goes the shame, which probably then leads to guilt, which then leads to fear of punishment and fear of doing something wrong because I'm guilty. So I'm looking at that whole domino effect and it seems like a natural cycle that all stemming from that abandonment. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can elaborate on that, if you think that's... Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's worthwhile. And actually, um, this is something that, that we could even dive into uh, at the conference. And it's something that I like to share. Um, and, and I'll just give a little snapshot of it right now. But yeah, it, when, when, when a child is born, like when we were born, um, the only part of our brain that was fully online and fully activated was a part down in our brain stem called the amygdala. That's the fight, fight, free, fight, flight, freeze mechanism that, that, that we've heard about. And it's all about survival. It also controls respiration, heartbeat, you know, a lot of things that are necessary for survival. It was fully online. The thinking and reasoning part of our brain didn't finish getting wired up for us guys till we were around 25 years old. Uh, and then other parts of the brains developed at their own pace. Language comes in, you know, close to two years old. The ability to remember things kind of in visually picture memory kind of begins around four or five years old. Most of us can't remember too many visual memories a lot younger than that. But that the, the amygdala, the survival part was online. And the theory is, is that we store up all emotional experiences in that part of the brain. So if that's the primary part of our brain that was, functioning full speed when we were just babies and we were vulnerable, we're exposed, you know, we're, we're you know, the, the, I think the mammal that has the longest period of time that we need our parents to take care of us, you know, most mammals just take off at a fairly young age. Um, so we're very, we're very vulnerable. And every time we have a negative experience, I something that just feels bad to us inside, that it gets internalized and stored in that part of the brain. Not logically, not with words, not with pictures, but at a, at a memory level. Now that part of the brain is hardwired into every other part of our brain. It, it communicates with the rest of the brain at a very high speed and is hardwired into all of our senses, uh, sight, smell, hearing, taste, touch. So for example, you know, that the fight, flight, freeze thing, you're driving your car down the road, you see something out of the corner of your eye, and before you even know what it is or can think about it, you know, your foot hits the brake, your hand, this hand goes back on the seat, and you don't know it, but your heart rate goes up, your body pumps adrenaline, cortisol, your palms, you know, get sweaty, the blood goes out of the, out of the outer regions, eyes dilate, all that stuff happens without you thinking about it. It's controlled by that, that, that little part of your brain is about the size of your little fingernail. Well, that part of the brain also controls every other part of our brain. So as we develop into adults and we think our way of viewing the world and reasoning and responding to the world and acting, we all think it makes perfect logical sense, but it's all still being controlled by that machine language, the operating system, the DOS down here in the brain stem. And if that internal inaccurately internalized, which it always does, it took in those emotions and began to build build constructs around them like i'm not good enough i'm unlovable if mom's angry at me i cause that if dad does this i cause that if mom and dad are fighting that's about me the the child is narcissistic by nature and internalizes everything is a, about it now this is inaccurate but we all do it as little children and then we all develop survival mechanisms and usually two very prominent ones one is to try to manage the uncomfortable feelings we're feeling in the moment, you know, the, the fear, the anxiety, the, the, the this. 
Um, we don't have words for it, but we try to manage it. The second survival mechanism is try to prevent the things happening again in the future that cause those uncomfortable feelings. Now, out of that comes all of human survival mechanisms that we use in daily life. Nice guy syndrome is just one of them, but it is based on those inaccurately internalized emotional beliefs that there's something wrong with me. Um, and, and I, I'm going to experience really dire consequences if people see that, if I don't hide it, or if I don't fix it in some way. And, and we're carrying that around and believing it, it makes perfect sense because we've never had any, anybody or anything to show us. No, that, that made sense when you were three days old, three weeks old, three, you know, three months old, but it doesn't make sense when you're 30. You know, we, we've got to develop some new, so a new, a new operating systems and a new machine language. It's fascinating because, uh, because you'll see, I'll see it with a lot of clients. I'm sure you see it too, as we go to validate that reality too. We're 30 years old and now through our subcommunication, the way we're looking at women, the way we're talking to women, the way we're talking to our girlfriend, we get them to treat us almost in the way we don't want to be treated or we're afraid of being treated at that <laughs> core level. And then we say, see, isn't that true? See, look, women are, is true. Ass. you know, why? Yeah, I, I work with a coach that calls it. I can't remember where he borrowed it from, but he calls it our occurring world. And ah. that, that means whatever we believe the world is, we find it. We, we recreate yeah. it all around us because that's and we all everybody does that. Everybody does it. Everybody walking the planet creates their occurring world. Yeah, and, we get it reflected and, back to us. Yeah. And, and you know, we're you know, talking with guys like around dating. I read in one book on codependency years ago, and I can't remember the author, um, but she said that we tend to be attracted to people who have some of the worst traits of both of our parents. <laughs> our occurring world is how we learned as little children to relate to mom and dad. Whatever, whatever imperfect things about them we had to learn to manage as kids, we're going to be attracted to people, not just girlfriends, but friends and, and you know, even the jobs we take that let us use those survival mechanisms that we that developed in our occurring world. And then we're not going to, we're not going to go out as adults and create a situation that doesn't let us use our best survival mechanisms. I mean, the, the mind just doesn't work like that. It wants to travel familiar territory, even if that familiar territory is painful and dysfunctional and toxic is what our mind knows. And that's why the work you do, the work I do, the work so many of us do really is helping people come to understand how they developed that occurring world, that dynamic, and how we can be conscious enough to start shifting that. And, you know, as, as crazy as this is, at least as crazy as it's played out in my life, when it comes to women, I'm amazingly attracted to unhappily married women. Mm -hmm. I've, I've tried it with a couple of them. Why? Well, my first love object, my mother, was an unhappily married woman. I spent all of my childhood, teen years, and part of my adult trying to make that unhappily married woman happy so that she would choose me, approve of me, and I'd be validated. And, and so, you know, I go out, and if a woman's unhappy, that's such an amazing turn on for me. I can fix that. I can get her happy. But guess what kind of relationships that leads me into? Yeah, not um, good. Not the, the, good anyway. the, the, the happy women, I don't, I don't even see them on this planet. I don't even know where they are. They, they must be in some other country besides the one I'm in. I yeah. only see unhappy ones. It's funny because I used to be really super drawn. I could sniff out a bipolar woman in any room, uh, any party. I could find them so fast. And I had this distinct way of being pulled to them, attracted to them. That was a real strong, almost like uncontrollable pull. So if I started talking to a girl and I felt that pull, at first it would just, I didn't understand it. But later I'd be like, she's got to be bipolar. And so it almost became distinctive to me and I started yes, to validate yes. it, right? And then eventually I started not wanting to get, I'd feel that pull and I want to get away from it because I started to understand it. And the other thing that really talks to what you just said is we, I would take new students out who are scared to death to approach women. And I was curious. So I'd say, they're terrified of women. They got fear of women. I said, just pick any girl here to ask directions, to ask something yeah. nice to. Yeah. And I watch, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell them who to walk up to. And I watch, and they will pick the most unavailable uh, woman almost every time. The woman yeah. that's going to guarantee to not be nice. <laughs> and they'll pass up three sweet, nice, open, relaxed girls, and they'll go right to the angry, shut down one. Yeah. And 
it blows my mind. Well, I tell guys, well, you know, we work with some of the same people and run the same things and guys will say, well, okay, you know, how, how do I, you know, I see a woman and, you know, how do, how do I approach her? How blah, 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 blah. And, and I, so for you know, you see this, the guys that have the minimal amount of social skills, no experience with women, want to do the hardest thing on the planet, yes. i.e. go to a noisy club, see the hottest woman across a bar and walk up to her and start a conversation, have her stay interested and at minimum give a phone number or go home with them. And I, I tell guys, even the pros who do this all the time, that's like the, you know, that's the Mount Everest of, of mm -hmm. how to do it. But it's like, you know, all, all, all these bad daters want to go, well, how do I go get that hot woman in the bar? You know, how, how do I have that thing? And I go, Hey, let's, let's start, let's start you know, with, with, with women that are actually open and receptive and might actually enjoy you starting a conversation yeah. with them. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go out and we'll create what feels familiar, what feels normal. And if getting rejected by women feels normal and familiar, I promise you, well, it, it's not hard to get women to do that. And, no, not at all. And we, we, we can do it. We can even get the nicest girl in the room to reject us. <laughs> yeah, if, if that's what feels normal, we'll create yeah. that occurring world. Yeah, um, that's why I love subcommunication work so much. It, it's People just can't see it until they see the subcommunication of what they're telling people and how they're telling people to treat them. It, it's so fascinating. Um, now, I see two types. This is something I, I didn't see you dress as much in your book, but I'm sure you've encountered it, and I was just curious. You talk about one, two types of nice guys, which I think is fascinating, but I also see another two type. Uh, one type that is really good at having a lot of people in their life and they're trying to take care of everybody and they're stressed mm -hmm. out and they're running around at hundred miles an hour and they're telling everybody, I have somebody in my family like this, that I'll handle that for you. I'll handle that for you. I'll pay for that. Yeah. Take care of that for you. And you can see they're, they're working themselves into an early grave. The other type I've noticed is the type that's probably either done that for a period of time and they got burned out and now he doesn't let anybody into his life back and he creates walls and like whoa if i let her in like they start to meet a girl but there's this sense that if i let her in i'm going to get attached i'm going to get addicted i'm going to get and then i'm going to start doing my old game again so then they end up pushing her away but then they regret it then they get upset that they pushed her away have you seen that distinction between the two you know i i, I i'm smiling because I, I i can see at least two or three things that contribute to this thing you're talking about right here um um one is yeah if if like when I got out of my second marriage after 25 years of marriage with a woman who, after I got done being married to her um, for, for 14 years, realized she was borderline personality. I'm also good at spotting those now as well, the BPDs. Um, but man, I, I'd done so many, so much heavy lifting in that relationship. I, I didn't even want to talk to women. So for several months after separating and divorcing, I, I didn't go, I, I wanted nothing to do with women. And it makes sense. You know, if you, if you've been codependent with women, you're, you're, you're doing double, triple, quadruple duty and, and they don't appreciate anything that you do. There's the covert contracts. And so you get resentful and, and, and that resentment can either, you know, we'll start lashing out, being negative, or we'll put up walls. And, um, and of course the walls don't serve us. And the other thing we start doing is when we meet somebody, we project, our past experiences onto them. Um, people have asked me, I'm, I've uh, got married for the third time coming up three years ago. And I'd said for a while, nice. once I learned, once I learned how to be single, thank you. And, and yeah. live alone. I really liked it. And for a long time I said, I'm never going to live with a woman again, never get married again, never raise another man's kids. Well, I'm living with a woman married to her and raising her kids. And the thing that changed was, you know, I was projecting a lot of my old negative experiences based on my lack of boundaries, my codependency, my tolerating bad behavior, my giving too much, my, all on me. I based my experience with women in the past and projected that onto to all others, including this woman who I'd been dating for you know quite some time and had a lot of strong feelings for. And I had to ask myself the question, if I wasn't projecting my past experiences with, with my intimate relationships onto this woman, would I have any fear of going deeper, getting closer, getting married? And I thought, no, I wouldn't. Because all my fears around getting married and getting closer to this woman were based on past experiences, not on who she was as a person and who I am now, 
with an ability to set boundaries or ask for what I want or stay differentiated or have healthy space or say no or stop or be a good ender for that matter. Those are skill sets I've learned that increase the odds of me having a good relationship with a good woman. But if men don't have those skill sets, um, yeah, we're going to get eaten alive in a relationship. And the thing that we do, I'll ask this question a lot of times in small groups of men. Going back to that thing I talked about, those, those survival skills we learned as, as little babies, little children in our family. I'll ask guys, what is your number one relationship fear? And that number one relationship fear usually goes back to those earliest experiences. We think it has to do with our first wife or second wife, but it goes back to mom and dad. We just recreate it with whatever's come since. And every guy can usually tell you what his number one relationship fear is. Getting smothered, getting trapped, being cheated on, you know, being neglected, being abused, being hurt. You know, we, we, most guys don't even have to think about it. They can tell you what their number one relationship fear is. And, and then, as you said, we, we, we've gone out and recreated that over and over again with women because it feels normal. Well, we also have a number one relationship fear defense mechanism. Right? And again, we learned these as little kids, little boys, uh, as children. And whatever our number one fear is, we will have a defense mechanism to protect us. If it's our fear of being trapped or smothered, we're kind of like this with women. We don't let them get too close. You know, if it's our fear of them getting angry at us, we tend to get like codependent and try to make sure everything's good all the time. We'll, we'll have a number one survival mechanism. But here's the problem. That number one survival me mechanism Pre just keeps us stuck and trapped and prevents us from actually really ever getting close to anybody and actually ever really just enjoying the depth of an intimate relationship. Yes. Because all the time, we know this one thing's going to happen to us and we've got our guard and protection up to make sure that thing doesn't happen or that we manage it when we see it coming. And all of those defense mechanisms, by the very nature, a defense mechanism keeps people from getting close to us. Yes. So as, as crazy as it sounds, we actually have to be able to identify our one, two, three top relationship fears and be willing to lean into those and be willing to, to show up in a very conscious way and let our adult relationships, I call them per, powerful personal growth machines. They, they will bring up every one of our childhood wounding, survival mechanisms. I mean, I, I was a marriage therapist for almost 30 years. So, you know, I, I, I tried to help couples. All right, they're struggling with each other. I try to help them understand, no, nah, you're really struggling. Each of you struggling with mom and dad. And you're just projecting that onto each other. And if you know that, you can use your partner to help you deal with those top one, two, or three relationship fears and help you understand why you picked the partner you picked, because they usually match those fears well, or 180 degrees the opposite, and then we'll flip back and forth usually between them, and what our defense mechanisms are. And most of the problems people have in relationship is built around those defense mechanisms, is what we're doing to protect ourselves from what we fear most, and then the other person, of course, keeps reacting to our defense mechanism as we keep reacting to theirs. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of two things. I remember, um, you know who Abraham Hicks is, right? The, uh, the author uh, uh, did a lot of the spiritual law of attraction books. Yeah, yeah. He said something in an interview. I just, I've always quoted it over and over. There's two quotes. One is from her and him or them or whatever you want to say. Him and his um, wife and whoever they were channeling. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she said, you bring two miserable people together, you get something a whole lot worse than miserable. And uh, <laughs> that's good. When you bring two happy people together, you can create something beautiful. So it talks to a lot about really leaning in and working out your stuff. But one of my mentors, Carl, who really taught me a, a lot of stuff, I uh, got uh, bless his soul. He's, he passed away last year. Amazing man. Um, he, he said to me, and I've, I've meditated on this so much. It was just a simple sentence. He said, if you're not willing, and it's a lot of polarity sentence. If you're not willing to have your heart broken wide open, you'll never experience, truly experience love. Mm hmm and that's exactly what you're talking to. You got to lean into those sharp points where you're scared, you're going to get vulnerable, you're going to get hurt, you're going to get challenged and you got to be willing to have it ripped open so that you can, you got to be willing to have it ripped open. Didn't say it's going to happen. Yeah. And so that you can actually connect with this person in front of you. And, um, and, and people are going to hurt you. If you are vulnerable, you are going to get hurt. And 
we can survive it and we can develop skills. You know, for example, you know, I, I, I did an exercise in the men's program I'm in about a year ago. Uh, I just want to say this real quick. Pain, we can learn to not make a big deal out of pain. This is something yeah. I think nice guys don't realize is they make such a big deal out of pain. And when you're healthy, you're like, okay, it's painful, but I can handle it. I'm a man. And that difference is huge when you get that realization. I just wanted to throw that in. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think I've heard something like, you know, pain, pain, pain is part of life. Suffering is optional. Yeah. Um, most of the suffering we do is through trying to avoid pain. Yeah. Pain is a part of life. The pain slow band-aid. Yeah. And yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, you'll hear me mention a lot, the thing around, men needing initiation, masculine initiation, and needing tribe. And I believe the number one thing that initiation always served for men was to teach us how to be comfortable feeling uncomfortable. And, and for most of us men nowadays, that's why I say we kind of tend to hang out in the nursery where it's comfortable. You know, it's comfortable surfing the internet. It's comfortable looking at porn. It's comfortable smoking dope. But they don't move us ahead as men. They don't expand us. They don't challenge us. As men, we need initiation, we need mentors, we need guidance, we need accountabilities, we need friends, we need guys to help us learn how to get comfortable being uncomfortable. I promise you, we, as humans, as men, we were not wired to be in long-term monogamous relationships with women. It's not in our DNA, it's not what we're wired for. We're not wired actually to approach and date. Dating has only existed in, in, in human history for about 60, 70 years maybe. You know, our parents just met somebody at church or somebody they went to school with, or, you know, most people just married their best friend's younger sister, or, you know, you know, dating hasn't existed, but we're all thinking we should be able to date. We should be able to have successful long-term relationships. All of that stuff is not in our DNA. So it's all going to make us uncomfortable. Yeah. And, you know, living with another human being, no matter who they are, you know, it could be Gandhi, it could be Jesus, it could be Buddha. They're going to make us uncomfortable at times. And, but to do anything of meaning in life, to have an intimate relationship, to live with purpose and passion, to, to, to live you know, up to our, our, our full potential, we got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And, sure. and you and I teach men how to do that with women. It's a great initiation. If we can learn to show up with women, hold on to ourselves, be present, be conscious, be available, set the tone and lead, have good boundaries when necessary, remove ourselves when necessary. Man, what 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 a per, fantastic opportunity to, to to grow us as men. And I think it. Uh, would you agree that initiation? And this is kind of the same thing you're saying. Really, is is a big part of initiation is to get men over the fear of death too in primitive tribes. Because, <sighs> yeah, because we I, I, we get so afraid to live because we're afraid to die. Yeah, I I, I almost died about a year and a half ago. So I I'm I'm with you on that. I I. I'll just tell the quick story. I, I, nobody could find out what was wrong with me, but I was in pain all the time. I lost 30 pounds, couldn't eat, had stomach pain all the time, went to doctors here in Mexico, doctors in Seattle. Nobody could figure out what was wrong. I was in pain constantly. I'd be awake all night. I just All I could do was breathe into it. I did learn how to deal with pain. I learned how to surrender into it. Yeah. I, maybe this is killing me. Maybe this is what life's going to be like. And um, finally, a, a, a doctor here in Mexico, ran the right test, did a CAT scan, said, you got a tumor blocking your small intestine. He said, we need to take that out now. Uh, I said, give me a day. Thank and, God um, they found it. Wow. They found it. And uh, I woke up from surgery, thought, I'm back. I'm alive. My mind was clear. And I laid in bed that night, rebuilt, reorganizing my website, repurposing everything, I've, all the things I've written. I've got a whiteboard right here that says 10 books in 10 years. I made that commitment a year ago, March, after we went to a Mankind Project weekend. And first question they asked is, what's your mission? Next weekend, I went to a workshop with John Wineland, my coach, the program I'm in. We talked about our purpose, our impossible goal. I said, I'm going to write 10 books in 10 years. And uh, I've completed two, and I'm partway through a third. And that was just a little over a year ago. Congratulations. So there's nothing like, you know, looking at death, going into surgery, um, and, you know, with a Mexican doctor in a Mexican hospital that you don't know from Adam and you're going, <laughs> I may not wake up. And I don't, if I do wake up, I don't know what kind of condition I'm going to be in. That you you, you, you got to be okay with it. You got to let go. Yeah. And, and I tell people, I was really at peace going into surgery. It might've been the Valium they put in yeah. me, but I was really at peace with 
this is okay. Whatever's happening here is okay. And I promise you, you, you have an experience like that. You want to live. I still yeah. fall back into old habits of, of like putting stuff off. And, but let me man, ask you it, really it quick, you up. that piece, you had how much pain before the surgery? So do you feel that pain got you to the point of the surrendering to all that pain got you to the point of peace over the surgery? No, like um, probably a combination. Yeah. Because probably a couple of things. One is that I was working with my coach for different reasons when I got sick and, and he does tons of different kinds of breath work, um, yogic, Wim Hof, um, just all kinds of Qigong types of breath and body work that helped a lot actually to just kind of just to be able to breathe into whatever I was experiencing, kind of connect with the cosmos and just, you know, just be with it. But I, I still remember one evening, Kind of lying in the bed, I was like napping three or four times a day, no energy, that constant stomach pain, uh, just cramping, cramping. And um, I just thought, okay, I'm going to quit fighting this. It just is what it is. You know, I don't know, what, I don't know where it's taking me. I, I still remember just surrendering completely into whatever, into the pain, into the unknown. The unknown was the hardest part. You know, if I had a diagnosis, that might have been easier, but I had no diagnosis excuse me that was hard but i surrendered into that as well all right i don't know i'm gonna surrender into not knowing and yes when by the time you know that the, they're wheeling me in for surgery i was kind of like okay i'm okay i'm good you know i was i was i was right where i needed to be a lot of letting yeah. go yeah. a lot letting of letting go yeah so i agree with you 100 percent that um carlos castaneda says you know keep keep death it's always right here at your left side you know, keep, keep it close to you. And, and he says something like, you know, we get so caught up, you know, in all these worries and stresses and all this. And he says, we really just need to turn over to death and say, uh, have you taken me yet? Mm -hmm. No, no, I haven't yet. So I guess maybe this other stuff doesn't matter so much. You know, th yeah. that's all that really matters is that what am I going to do in this day that I have here alive? Right now. Yeah. I had a similar experience, not, not as bad as yours i didn't have a tumor but i i did have blood in my throat blood in my urine at one point and i just had to take a year off to cleanse and meditate and i was shaking and, and had tremors and i thought i was going to die and that because as i was cleansing everything was coming out of my body it was a pretty intense experience and i remember dreaming i died in one dream which i didn't even know was possible i woke up terrified shaking inside there was so much anxiety in my body that i got in touch with in that cleanse and after that year started to come to an end because I spent all day, as many hours as I could afford in a day, meditating and releasing and meditating and releasing and doing a lot of work from Lester Levinson. Um, it was almost like my life took off naturally again. I, had, I took the force out that I had before and I started rising back up with way more success than I ever had before with the, way more ease. And yeah. uh, like I got I, out of my own way. I like that, the way more ease part. I mean... You know, my wife gets a look on her face that at one time would have just, oh, no, she's mad at me. It's just kind of like, yeah, okay, you know, let's talk about it. It's kind of like, you know, there's just not the reaction. It's like everything takes on a different perspective. And like, as you say, it's just a lot more ease to it. I'm, I'm parenting again. I've got a 14-year-old stepson, 11-year-old stepdaughter. It's kind of like, uh, it's just a breeze. I just, you know, I just spend time with them and, you know. You know, I love, love on them and, and, you know, they, they actually don't require all that much work. They just need some love and attention and know that they're okay and kind of keep introducing them to the world and what they, what they need to, you know, function well in this world and everything. There's just, I, I love that. There's just an, a, a greater ease to it. Yes. Um, My dad had two children in the Swifties too, by the way, and um, they were the most well-adjusted, well-raised children he raised of a lot. And he loved raising them. He was such a good dad. And he's he's eighty something now, still tons of energy, full of life. This guy. And unfortunately, I wasn't raised around him. I was I was I was taken away from him at a young age. Didn't meet him until I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. But the amount of love this man has, and how sweet he is, and how he grabbed the first time he met me as a teenager, he grabbed me, and, and I was not used to love. I was not used to hugging. He grabs me and hugs me and holds me and says, "I love you, son." And I'm like trying to squirm out. You know, I can't, I can't handle this. But what is this? This is a man's man. I, you know, and then I, 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 I wish I had spent more time with him. But I, it was almost like a fear of being around him. You know, yeah. I really was masculine and not afraid to show his heart at the same time. 
Yeah, I, I, I love that. Not afraid to show show the heart. That kind of that brings us back to what we were talking about, about the relationship dynamic. I did an interview this morning and, um, you know, and, and a lot of times the, this thing we talk about in interviews cover the same material, but they go different directions. And lately, it seems like I get asked a lot about like the manosphere and incels and men going their own way and, and, um, you know, red pill and you know all those combinations big topic, yeah yeah if we, and, if we had hours and hours i would love to cover that too but I, yeah <laughs> but here's here's just the one the one observation i shared is that um you know well, i was talking about making the decision he asked me why did you decide to marry your wife and get married again and i said you know i, I, I kind of told a little bit what i've said here and part of it was just asking myself what's the most loving thing to do and just with only that question to guide me, what is the most loving thing to do for this person for that I loved, her kids, myself? It would, well, let's, let's, go, let's go as deep as we can go. You know, open up, take the risk, go as deep as we can go and see, see what this is capable of. And I said, it was, it was a very open-hearted decision. And I made the comment to him, I said, you won't find many discussions about being open-hearted in the manosphere. No. And, and, and that I think is, is kind of the main thing that, kind of puts me on edge is that you know it's almost paranoia and women are out to get us and they're this and you know they've done this to me and they're all and it's just everybody's got this edge to them and um at, number one that's not particularly attractive and and number two you know it does it doesn't feel good inside of us and can you is it possible to think that way and have any decent relationship with women I, probably not. And no. and if we do attract women, what kind of women are we going to attract if if we think they're all you yeah. know, hypergamous, gold digging, you know, fill in the blanks? If if that's our view of women, we are going to find those kinds of women. Yes. I promise you, because that's all we can see. And I promise you, and I've had to work on this. I've had to work at my own resentments towards women, the rage I've had at women. I remember when I was writing early drafts of No More Mr. Nice Guy. You know, people would give me comments back and I kept hearing, you seem to have rage at women. And I thought, oh, doesn't everybody? <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, I need to look at that. I need to look at that because not only did I not only want it coming through in a book I wrote, I thought, I don't want to live my life. And, and it, it is a piece that I had to constantly look at is how would I build up resentments at women and had to do a lot of work around releasing that. And here's here's probably not too hard to figure out as I released those rage and resentment and feeling of helplessness and became more confident in myself and more open-hearted and better boundaried, um, I attracted a, a much different kind of woman and, uh, you know, stands to reason. Okay. Um, I think that's, uh, that's super true because I've experienced the same thing. Since I started this process, I used to attract uh, a lot of high maintenance women in the beginning that I, you know, my mother was bipolar and, I took care of her and, you know, you had the surrogate father thing going on and surrogate husband, excuse me. And, um, as I grown over the years, the amount, the more giving women become every year that, that I meet, it just amazes me. And I didn't even know those women existed in the beginning and uh, they were always there. Just they were always there. Yeah. My, my um, wife is the most affectionate, open hearted, generous, loving. I, I, it still boggles my mind that, that uh -huh. somehow, I, I bumbled my way into a relationship with her. I'm glad to hear that. I'd say you deserve it after all this work. You created a lot of value in the world. Uh -huh. um, what I want to do is turn this, because uh, we're getting towards the end of an hour, right around there. I want to turn it towards some questions from the audience. And uh, and I've got some questions that people have already sent in. So I'm going to start with those. And I, then... I, 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 I've got the, the chat box over here. I'm, I, every now and then I take a moment and look over uh -huh. there. Some, uh, yeah, those are good questions. Oh, those are good comments. So, okay. Bring, I, I love questions. Bring the I questions. intended to only go an hour and, uh, um, you know, to do about a half hour and then do, dive into the questions. And then um, what happened was, 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 I feel like there's so much we could talk about, but I'm going to leave it at this. Um, if you got a little extra time, we'll go a little over an hour. I, and, I, I don't have a hard stop. Uh, I, I even told my wife I, I, I had two hours booked for this. So, okay, perfect. Um, so let's, let's just do what, 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 what's needed here. Yeah, I also wanted to read, there's that quote you got in the book and everybody look it up. Um, it's that quote from Bly, Robert Bly and Iron, um, Iron John. I just think it's so perfect and so realistic and everybody check that out. It's a, you'll find it in the No More Mr. Nice Guy book. 
So um, I have not read that book yet either, and I'm going to immediately go out and buy a copy and read it. So. Well, well, let me say that the Iron John, when I started my own recovery, that was about all that was out there in terms of men's stuff, right? Um, kind of Joseph Campbell, maybe Hero's Journey, maybe you want to go back into Young. But, but Michael Mead, Robert Bly, that was about all that was really out there for men. And I remember the first, and it's, all, I'll call it, it's considered mythopoetic. You know, they're telling a story. And I remember first time I read Iron John was even before I even thought about writing a book. And I, I kind of, okay, I get it. But man, it kind of lost me a lot. I read it again, probably either partway through my book or after I'd finished it, read it again. And I thought, oh man, this is a really good book. I, I, I talk about the exact same thing he talks about and you know, it's just, we just talk about it in, in different language yes. basically. But, but yeah, so I, I recommend people read it, sit with it for a while, then go back and read it again. I say the same thing about your book, by the way. I say the same thing about David Data's books. Uh, it's a way of spirit man too. Yeah. Uh, they're uh, a few required reads. Um, it's funny. Almost, <laughs> almost every interview I do when I when I hear the most referenced books, it is usually my book and Way of the Superior Man. And yeah. Way of the Superior Man is one of the books I recommend the most as well. To, to they're people. they're they're good companion books. Um, very moving, different, but very yeah. good companion books. I agree. And David Data would talk about first stage, second stage, third stage men, and and you know, no more Mr. Nice Guy. I see is a lot of description of second stage men. Yeah. And uh, and then if you're trying to move to that way, the spirit man, third stage man, and that, that you read both books, you can really see that transition. Um, and I think there is benefit to having been a nice guy. You, you learn to really develop that feeling side of you then bring back your masculinity and put the two together, you know, and, and stop being. But um, um, let's dive into these questions and, uh, right. and see what people have to say out there. This is a... Are you going to read them to me or do I click on the Q&A box or I'm going to read a couple questions that we got uh, sent into us and then All right. we'll bring them in the box and then we'll I'll do my best. Them. Okay. Um, question number one is from uh, anonymous. I'm in a really, this, this one's an interesting one. I can already, I'm already pre predicting, trying to predict how you're going to react. I'm in a relationship with a wonderful woman. However, I have an urge to have more kids. And I envision myself with a younger woman who's more physically fit. The backstory is that my girlfriend is 48 and I'm 42. I currently have two kids, ages 10 and 8. My girlfriend is a uh, my girlfriend is a 10 when it comes to meeting my emotional needs, an 8 when it comes to intellectual compatibility, and a 4 to 6. She's fat, right? Physical attractiveness, yes. My question is whether my urge for more offspring in the younger woman is a biologically based man's natural urge to have more kids with younger women. If so, how do I navigate this urge? Meaning I have a wonderful and beautiful woman, but what do I do with the desire? Do I tell her my desires and let go, let go a let go a beautiful loyal let go of a beautiful loyal woman, or do I somehow channel these desires? as a natural, but not necessarily uh, requiring action? Okay, a good question. He's insightful. Um, I got about three responses to it. I'll, I'll try to keep each one of them short. One of them we okay. already talked about, and that is our number one relationship fear and our defense mechanism against it. Almost every man is gonna be dissatisfied with his woman. That's just part of it. That's, that's actually just part of being man, but it's also part of a defense mechanism. At some point, we're all going to be dissatisfied with our woman. And at some point, maybe the entire relationship, we're going to see other women that look more attractive to us. That is always going to happen. One of the things I'll tell guys, if they haven't noticed it yet, the older you get, the more younger women there are out there. It's just a fact of mathematics. And uh, man, I, I just see younger women everywhere I go. And of course they look good. Of course they look good. Um, but for anybody that's ever based a relationship decision purely on how a woman looks, they know where that tends to, to take a relationship, not, not in good directions particularly. Um, I think we should be physically attracted to people we're with. And for mature people, attraction is based on a lot of things, not just their physical appearance. Um, maybe he's settled. But maybe he's just finding, you know, oh, it, th this would probably be better over, over the, you know, it always looks better over there when we're with a woman for any period of time, always. 
and that's just part of it. We have, that's part of men is what we learn to not let our mind create those little scenarios. Well, that one would be better. That one would be better. We don't know. We have no fucking clue if that one would be better. Okay. His story is what I smile at. Um, men are not evolutionarily programmed to want kids. Men are evolutionarily programmed to put their penises in vaginas. That's a big difference than him wanting kids. His wanting kids is probably an old story of wanting some sort of intact family that goes back to childhood, of the complete intact family that, that was loving. And, and I've felt that before. I've felt I, see that, that. I said a lot in Latin cultures, like my friend Carlos, who I grew up with, won nine kids. You know, he wanted a big family. And of course, his wife put a stop to that. She was like, no, we're stopping at three. Yeah. Uh, in macho cultures, it's not uncommon. I live in a macho culture. And the reason that most men want a bunch of kids is to keep their wife at home so that their wives don't stray. That's mm -hmm. really the reason that, that men tend to want the big families. And often they don't do that good a job of taking care of all the kids they, they've created, at least in macho cultures. So he, he needs to go address these issues with a coach or a therapist. Um, those are not the issues he, you know, if you're feeling unattracted to your, to your woman, there are ways you deal with that, but you first have to deal with, are you projecting things from somewhere else? Because I found, for example, my wife is not somebody who would have turned my head physically when I first met her. I think she's fucking gorgeous because of all the deeper ways that I'm attracted to her. So that we go work that out somewhere else other than with his wife and also come to the conclusion that as long as we are in monogamous long-term relationships, we're always going to long to be out of them no matter how good a care the woman takes care of us. And, and you, to maintain that love, you've got to constantly be going deeper, growing together in some way. I see so many couples that try to, once we're married, we just stop here. We got our beer and our lounge chair and our big screen TV, yeah. we're done. Yeah. And that's a surefire way to die, you know, the relationship to die. So. It is, I agree. And I'll just add one other piece to this guy. And we, I know you got a bunch more questions. Um, keep working on what I call your great cake of a life. And that is pursuing your passions, spending time with guy friends, um, regular strenuous exercise, lean into challenge, some kind of devotional spiritual practice, give your <clears> gift <throat> to the world. And then that great cake, a woman is only the icing on top. And there's something about the better the cake a man makes, the, the sweeter the woman on top is. But as soon as we get focused on the woman and how she's not this or she's not that, we've <clears> made her our cake. And I find that when men have a great cake, um, they, they don't tend to get into as many of those things or, or feeling dissatisfied with their woman. The answer. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Question number two. I, I find that even if I'm dating a hot girl and the sex is exciting at first, after two or three, it's kind of addressing the same thing. So I don't know if we want to go over it, but after two or three uh, or six months, the sex becomes boring. What do, I, what do you think? The reason is, do you think that as a man programmed by nature to spread his seed as much as possible, I will always be looking for somebody else to bed, uh, no matter how much I love my partner? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll give a personal answer to it. I, I know what he's talking about. And as a marriage therapist, that tends to happen. You know, people lose interest in each other. Really good book I recommend is called Mating in Captivity um, by um, Esther Pearl, Perel, Esther Perel. She basically says, and I agree with this, the more intimate we are, i.e. the better we know somebody, the more it tends to kill sex. Intimacy and hot sex don't tend to go well together. But we kind of have this idea that the more intimate we are, the better sex we'll get. So intimacy actually tends to, to put a damp on sex. Um, but the personal example, my wife and I, um, we've been together five years, been married three. And monogamy is not natural. It's not biologically wired into us. But I believe you can create a monogamous context that is amazingly hot. Um, my wife and I, here's what we've done. We've created a container around our sexuality. And our, we do not, neither one of us permits our sexuality to leak outside of that container. And, and men and women all leak in their own different ways. Women kind of leak, trying, you know, seeking men's attention, going on social media, you know, oh, I've got these guys paying attention to me, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, Instagram. Women leak. For that. Pardon? Instagram. Women Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. Okay. 
men tend to leak it out through that, you know, fantasizing about other women, the porn, mm -hmm. masturbation, hidden secretive little things. Women do the hidden secret stuff too. Mm -hmm. My wife and I do not do any of those. All right. I don't masturbate unless I'm with her. I do not fantasize about other women. I do not look at porn. These are all my choices. And she doesn't leak her energy out either. It all stays in our container. So if nothing's leaking out and it all stays in the container, and she and I have, have an impeccable trust with each other. So we, we can trust each other to be vulnerable. And within that container, she and I have given ourselves permission to do whatever we have the impulse to do. But it always is together. Now, that, you know, men's our minds are going to start spinning. Well, they go do this. And we, we've had some adventures that, that have involved other people. But that's not our norm. The norm is typically we tell each other lots of nasty stories that involve all kinds of adventures. And our rule around those stories is they can't involve anybody we know. And we can't go out and try to make them happen. Now, yeah. if, if a door opens, you know, and we're both good with it and we're both connected, we'll walk through the open door, but we don't go looking to, for doors. But in that container of, like I said, the stories my wife can tell me, you know, around sex is just blow my mind. You know, mm -hmm. she, she's just a typical uh, jealous Latino woman that she's have all these fears. I'm going to go do all these things that she's actually talking about. And she yeah. gets nasty and she gets perverted. She gets taboo with it. And yeah, women tend to blow minds, uh, men's minds, I found, when they start telling their stories, yeah. When they feel safe, right, in that yeah. container, right, and that the man yeah. isn't going to go use it or go, you know, whatever, it stays there. The other thing is, my wife and I are like a couple of bonobos. We, we touch each other all the time. If she walks in my office and I'm sitting here, um, she, she knows I'm going to pull up her top and put her breast in my mouth. I'm always touching her. She's always touching me. We just, we just don't hold anything back from each other. And I tell you what, our sex is never, ever boring. And it's not unusual for us to have sex two or three times a day. That does, that's not every day, but it's not an unusual occurrence. And I say all that because... This is, this is a man in his 60s, right? I'm 63. And now, that's, I, I, am, that's I, am grateful, I am grateful for Viagra and testosterone <laughs> supplementation. She's 22 years younger than me. Yeah. But just wants sex all the time is, is her love language. So I'm not trying to like do anything to anybody other than we can have a monogamous relationship where the sex stays hot, but there's certain things that have to be in place to make that happen. Well, the container is so important and not leaking because it, it build up all that sexual energy and you have, and this is your outlet. And every time you, you use her for an outlet, just like porn becomes habit, she becomes the habit of the outlet, the way I'm hearing it versus the porn. Um, do you believe in any of the uh, having sex without ejaculating, man? Talk to you. Uh, I, I was just going to add to that. I, I I only come about once or twice a month. Um, and that do, helps do so the, much. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, it changed our sex life. First time I introduced that idea from, from some, some clients of mine that have done the, uh, the new TNT, you know, just there's different guys that come at it from different ways. I said, when I introduced it to my wife when we were married, she said, well, you can't do that. You can't go a week without ejaculating. So I'm going to try. And then, you know, about two weeks into this, she started telling everybody she knew, tell your man not to come. Tell your man. She's telling her gay friends, her women friends, tell your man not to come. It's better. Um, it got darker, nastier when I quit coming. Because when we guys come, everything comes to a screeching halt. You know? yes, it does. But if the guy isn't coming, this shit can go on for hours. And yeah, I mean, you got to learn to breathe. You got to learn to slow. You got to learn to, and, and you don't do math problems in your head. You stay present. You just learn to, to, to feel the ebb and flow of, of the sexual energy. It's part of learning to get comfortable with tension, but it, it, it's yes. If I came every time we had sex, I'd lose interest in sex by me not coming. It keeps my interest up at, at a high level as now, well. For all the guys, this is what guys always say is like, if I don't come, uh, then I'm going to be unsatisfied and get blue balls. And what happens? Doesn't happen. Yeah. That's you not know, real. It's just, uh, you may have tension, but you can learn to move tension in your body to breathe into it. And so, okay, you got tension. It should keep driving you back to your partner. And yeah, you learn to run the pleasure through your body more rather than exactly. out of your car. Yeah. And you learn to run it into your life more instead of out of your cock. You bring that tension and that energy to penetrating the world. You, br you bring your A game to the world. 
guys, I get, you know, kind of like, I, I, I can't do that. I promise you, I didn't start doing this until probably as probably 60, probably a little before late fifties. And I believe it or not, I used to find excuses to not have sex. Now, you know, I don't need to, my energy level stays at, at this high peak. So my wife probably comes a hundred times a month. I come once or twice. And, um, it, but you, you're in a real, in a, it sounds unfair, but in a real sort of way, when you're running that energy through your body, you're kind of coming energetically if you're not coming physically. So, you know, cause you get that little tingle and that warmth and that excess energy and that, that life that comes through you. And that's, yeah. that's, that's a form of coming. I don't know. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a form of energy and it's powerful. And, yeah. uh, and orgasm, and, I should say orgasm, not coming. So. Yeah. Well, well, here's the thing again, I think an immature man avoids tension, discomfort, or tries to release it as soon as possible. A mature man has learned to embrace discomfort, yes. embrace challenge, embrace tension, and has learned to dance with it and channel it and use it. I mean, Freud talked about this, about you know sublimating sexual drive into every good thing that's ever happened in the, in the world. You know, yes. building things, curing things, fixing things. Um, that's what mature men do. They, they use their nice energy guy. in a mature way. Exactly. Nice guys want to dissipate energy and get everything calm and smooth. Yeah, we want to increase the energy and play with it like Plato. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yeah. on the same page. Yes. Okay. Question number three. Um, uh, <laughs> this is great. It's all coming along. It's all working perfect. What is the best way to deal with my, uh, your partner? when she is or appears to be not in the mood to have sex, but, but you feel horny. It doesn't happen to me lot much, but luckily, uh, but I, I uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm going to shorten the question because there's a lot more. Of him okay. Yeah. Okay, that, that sounds perfect. And, and yet that's, you know, that's kind of the, the guy question, the guy dilemma. My, my second marriage, you know, my, my wife rarely wanted to have sex. She, she announced, we had an affair with each other, right? We're both married and this, the fair culminated in us getting married to each other. So it was highly sexual. And on our honeymoon, she says, aren't you glad now that we're married, we don't have to pretend to like sex anymore. I'm thinking, huh? I wasn't pretending. So I spent 14 more years with her trying to figure out, you know, trying to get her to want to have sex. We'd go months without sex. Okay. In that situation, there's no turning that around. If, if a woman just has no interest in having sex with you for whatever reason, there's no turning that around. Um, don't, don't spend years trying to fix that. Now, if it's a situation where he's, you know, in the mood a little bit more often than her, uh, that, that's, that's, that's not the big issue. And every now and then you don't get it every time you want it, but he's probably still into ejaculation sex as well. He's wanting to ejaculate probably. Um, but there's also that wanting the closeness and we have closeness without having to have penetration or ejaculation. So, I don't know that I have like, well, here's the answer about to fix it. I'd, I'd need to talk with, you know, both him and his partner. But part of this is finding a good match to match you sexually. And one of the things I tell guys, you need to be willing to get to rejection quickly with your woman around sex, meaning you need to find out quickly, is she a good match for you? If you would prefer to have sex five, six times a week or twice a day, and she wants it every month or so, that's not a very good match. And you got to be willing to accept that's not a very good match. Yeah, and his question, I, I was a little unfair to him. He said uh, later on, he says, you know, it doesn't happen very often, so it's good. And they, and they do enjoy sex yeah. together. But how does he, he was kind of questioning what's the best way to deal with the re feeling rejected uh, when she says no. And he says, uh, he says, I just say to myself, that's her loss. Is that a good way to do it? If okay. You know, well, let's talk about that. That's a little bit different issue. So let's talk about the rejection issue. Um, and I, I have to deal with this a lot with men around dating and stuff, but I tell guys rejection doesn't hurt. And I can, I can, I can do fun exercises with guys where they get rejected over and over again and they have fun doing it is context. If you believe a person's low interest, that's all I call it. Low interest, in talking to you, giving you a phone number, having sex with you, even if it's your partner, if you take their low, low interest in whatever, as a sign that you're unlovable, you're defective, you're not good enough, i.e. if it ties into our shame, rejection hurts. But, that, but it's not the rejection that hurts, it's the meaning we put on it, the context, the story. And so we, we make up stories. Well, that woman didn't talk to me because blah, blah. Either we make it about us or we make it about her. 
probably were wrong either way we look at it. Our stories usually are not very accurate. So he creates a story if his wife is not sexually interested. And then he believes his story. And if the story matches old shame, internalized shame pieces, it hurts. Okay. So here's what happens with a lot of guys is that we have a need for connectedness or closeness, or maybe we're, we have some repressed emotional state. We're anxious, we're scared, we're, you know, whatever, something's going on. And what we men tend to do when we have uncomfortable emotional states, we go up into our head and overthink, overanalyze, or we go down into our genitals and try to squeeze the tension out that way. We do that with our women. We will have this unexpressed, unknown emotional state, and we get all analytical, or we want to go, you know, you know, squeeze one off, jerk it off, whatever, have sex with our woman. So a lot of times when we're having emotional need, we come to our woman sexually, and women are highly tuned to masculine neediness. It feels shitty to them. It, it, it just does. Um, that doesn't mean they're, they don't want us to have emotional states that are okay with that. It's when we have a repressed emotional neediness, it feels like this big emotional hose we want to suck up and you know, hook up to them and suck something out of them to take care of our little boy that's not feeling good right now. Women feel it. It repulses them. So often they kind of go like this when they feel our neediness. We, what we've done is we, we've, we've, we've put our emotional neediness on top of sex we presented to them as a sexual request. They've said no to our emotional neediness. We take it as a rejection of both our sexual desires and what we don't realize because we're emotionally needy, they're not letting us hook up the hose, just intensifies whatever that un, undealt with emotional state is. So then we kind of go internalize and turn into little boys and ruminate and be pissy that, oh, you know, she didn't want me. She didn't want to take care of me. It's usually repeating an old story. So I would tell the guy, rather than trying to get his wife to have sex when she's not in the mood, instead, notice the story he makes up about her not being in the mood. Notice the emotional state he lets himself go into and then ask himself, what story is this emotional state and story telling me about me. Now, what is it telling me about her? Was it, it's his stuff, it's his mood. What yep. is it telling him about him? And then if he's open to it, he'll go, oh, yeah, I'm probably not feeling needed right now, or I'm feeling kind of lonely right now, or I'm, I'm stressed about this thing at work tomorrow, and I just wanted a distraction. And then you can go deal with whatever's real. Then our women are going to find us more attractive. It's, it's, it's a it's a great answer and I um, it reminds me I, I'll just tell this short little story I was on um, might have been mushrooms at one time with my girlfriend and uh, we took them together and she made me really mad at, right as we started and I went into a slightly bad trip and I was trying to get out of it and I realized this, I can't get out of this because I separated from her I went to another room so I went and laid down next to her and said I need to face the fear I need to face the emotion or the anger mm -hmm. and as I was laying next to her it started to dissolve and then I could feel myself getting comfortable being next to her and everything, whatever the story was went away. Yeah. But then I started to want closeness from her. I wanted her to hold her. I wanted her close to me. And I was like, I started to feel this little neediness. So I started to lean into her with the neediness and instantly she pulled away on like, like the moment she's like, Ugh, and she turned her back yeah. to me. Yeah. And so I said, that's fascinating. And my mind went, I wonder if she felt that neediness. So I laid yeah. back. And I said, can I get comfortable for myself and just enjoy me? And I started to move in that direction. So I'm, it's easy on mushrooms, you know. <laughs> she literally starts crawling up next to me and cuddles up to me. Yeah. And then I said, can I bring back the neediness and see what happens? So I did. I called it back up. And she, boom, back away. So she yeah. Confidence. She comes back. It was so, she was so on point with it. It was shocking. And hey, they're, 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 they're just highly sensitive. And I love how you played with it. And you can, and I'll tell you guys, if, if, if I know how men will take this and I, and I see people are typing in here and, and they're getting it pretty accurate. This doesn't mean your woman doesn't want you to have needs or doesn't want you to be emotional. Right. In fact, uh, here's what guys can try. If they notice themselves feeling needy, sexually needy, emotionally needy, and they have a woman in their life, go to the woman. And I mean, first of all, well, there's different ways. You can go hit the gym. I found just lifting weights 
sense to take all the neediness out of me. You can't be whiny, needy, and run stories when you got a bunch of weight over your head. Um, so that's one way. Go, go hang out with men. It tends to kill your neediness as well. But try this. If you notice you're feeling needy, go to your woman and just tell her, I notice I'm feeling really needy. What are you available for? What, what, can, what are you willing to give to me to help me with my neediness right now? And, and I have a feeling that most women, just you've, you've put it out there. There's no covert contract. I'm feeling really needy. How available are you to help me with my neediness? And she might, you know, she might even get playful about it. Well, what do you need? Well, how can I help you? It shifts the dynamic rather than being that repulsive, you know, come take care of me, mommy, to like, hey, I'm needy, adult. You've just named what you're experiencing. Are you available to help me not feel so needy? That's beautiful. I love it. And then, because you own your emotions and you, and you stop making them wrong or right, girls tend to want to help out. It's when you will get all wrapped up in them that they don't want to step in and be there with you. So I think it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's go to some of these questions. Cairo, did you mark any or do you want him to pick them or do you want to, do you want to, actually, I want to address this one right here. Norman wrote, uh, I saw Norman wrote um, something about Brian only works with younger guys. Norman, do you know how old I am? I'm 50 years old. I turned 51 uh, in October. Uh, Sam was a client of mine. And uh, yes, yeah, Sam is older though. He's, uh, he's 63. So um, so let's uh, dive in. What, what did you want to do, Kyra? I already am. Hey, did you mark some? Okay, so let's do this. Uh, I'm, I'm, we're on the Q&A box now. Let's, let's play with some of these. Um, it's kind of, I'm just going to grab them at random. There's so just, many. Just grab them and give them to me. I'll, I'll let you be in charge of that. I'll go wherever you take it. Okay, perfect. A lot of it's uh, compliments. You're getting tons of compliments. Um, well, you can read me all of those. That's fine. <laughs> I feel like I've been destroyed by the nice guy syndrome. Thanks. Um, let's keep going down until we find a good question here. Let's go back up. Uh, rejection does hurt. Tie it into my shame. How do I change... How do I change? I hate my masculine neediness. I can feel it. So all he's asking is, how do I change? I think with that, you kind of got to just read the book. When, and <laughs> yeah, just read work. the book. It's a generalized question, right? Yeah. Well, um, let, let me throw out a piece that I don't know if it addresses it particularly, but I, I do address this in the book. And, and I, I went back two years ago, and they put out a, a, a newer edition of No More Mr. Nice Guy. It didn't really change the book. We just cleaned up some typos and errors. But I wrote a forward for it about what I'd learned about me, how my life had been in the 15 years after writing the book. And the main conclusion I came to that I shared in that forward of, of the book was that recovery from the nice guy syndrome is not about becoming a better man, a better me, a different me, but becoming more me to, to accepting and loving me as, as I am. And I know a lot of us don't like ourselves and, and we want to be better and different and, and good. It, and our real challenge is learning to love every part of ourselves, even the part that we look in the mirror and don't like, even the part that's caused us pain in the past, even the part that we have shame about. Trying to push that away, change it, fix it, is not about being authentic. Being authentic is about, this is me. This is who I am. You know, I'm 63, receding hairline, these flaws, you know, I mentioned an affair I've had, mentioned this, mentioned that, you know, this is me. And learning to love all of me just, just lets you be at peace in, in your own self. And it makes you amazingly attractive to other people. The more I liked me, lived life on my terms, got comfortable in my own skin, the more just you know, when I became single, just noticing women coming out of the woodwork everywhere I went without having to try. They're just drawn yeah. to people that are comfortable being who they are. Very much so. They want to, they want to come into your reality, but your reality has got to be fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's um, got to be, got to, you know, there's, there's a quote in my new book, Dating Essentials for Men, that somebody just posted on a blog that it really hit their attention, that women are attracted to a man who looks like he knows where he's going and having a good time getting there. Nice. Yes, I want to get to that book in a second. And I think that's, that's perfect. Uh, let's get a couple more questions in from the chat. Um, hi, it's an amazing conversation. 
I was wondering if you can ach uh, achieve this journey, this change by yourself, or is it absolutely necessary to have help or other people? I say this because actually I'm in the process of auditing my friendship list. Most of them are not helpful and I'm in the process of having new friends. Uh, yes, you have to, you have to do this with others. I, I say that in the very beginning of no more Mr. Nice Guy. Don't try to do it alone. Nice guy syndrome did not develop in social isolation. You're not going to fix it in social isolation. And nice guys, because of our shame, want to say, well, I'll just go fix it by myself. Um, but it doesn't work that way. Like, you know, Mitch, I'm, I'm 63. Uh, I've done a shitload of my own personal work. I've worked with thousands of nice guys. I have a coach. I'm in a men's program. Um, I, I'm taking a voice class right now with, with a, an acting voice teacher who's actually in my men's program. And last night I had to read um, a poem, a love poem. And I tell you what, I felt so vulnerable reading that poem and then getting feedback from people is kind of like, I'm thinking, you know, it made me feel vulnerable, but I thought that's where our growth comes from is that vulnerability. And I can't, I couldn't do that by myself. I was in a group of people that gave me feedback that, you know, that, could be both critical and could be both praise. So don't try to do this alone. When I, when I started working, you mentioned John Wineland. When I started working with him two years ago, he said, Robert, what do you want from me? You know, I, I, you know, I love your book. I recommend it to everybody in my programs. And I said, yeah, but you got stuff I need and I'm still working on me. And I said, I, I'm not done. I, I still need this. So don't try to go it alone. Luckily, the internet's out there now. Your program, there's a zillion programs out there of men helping men. So there's no excuse to go alone. Even if you go to a 12 step program, that's how I started. Go to mankind project, go. There's all kinds of different ways to, to get resources, but, but don't go it alone. Yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent. I, you know, you know, you got to work with other people. You got to get reflected back to you, what you're feeling and how you're being. If you don't right. get reflected back to you, you're just high, You're going to end up living in a bubble your whole life because every, you might feel good alone renunciating and sitting on a mountaintop, but the moment you get around people in tension again, all your shit's going to come back up. Mm -hmm. and, and so you need to be around people and get used to having your shit reflected back to you. Yeah. And, and get, go find a good group of guys that'll do that. I, I got guys that hold me accountable that know me well enough that, um, that yeah, I can't get away with shit and I don't want to. I don't want to get away with shit. I, 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 I want to be seen. I want to be called out. I want to be loved on and supported and yeah. encouraged. And that's healthy. I think that's super healthy to want that and to get to where you can take feedback and not take it personal. Even if the person is delivering it in an asshole -ish way, it's just life, you know? Yeah. Um, there's still something to learn from it. You don't have to keep associating with the person that be, that's deliberately trying to hurt you. No, I but, don't. Yeah, but you can still learn something from that. How did I bring this person to my life? Why are they even here? And then yeah. how do I make sure another one doesn't show up? Exactly. I, I don't hang out with dicks. I don't hang out with yeah. people who treat me badly. I, that was a decision I made about 15 years ago. Um, there's pl uh, plenty of people who want to treat me well. I like okay. hanging out with them. Perfect. Let's do a, a couple more questions, and then I'm going to let you talk about your book and uh, for a little bit, your new book. Okay. We'll close it out. And, um, and uh, this, this one right here is very simple, but I, I thought about it a little bit, and I think it's an important question. Um, what's the defense mechanism for the fear of getting fucked over is what he's asking. And I, I, when I look at that, I think that's a lot of guys today. They're afraid mm -hmm. of having all their money taken away. They're afraid of the women taking advantage of them. They're afraid of the women you know, because of the, because of all this, the me too movement and all this stuff mm -hmm. today. Yeah. So, Well, I have two thoughts that just pop up with the question. Yeah. I, I get that. That that's the fear. Uh, well, I have maybe three thoughts. Number one, no matter what happens, you'll handle it. Um, I've been divorced twice. Um, neither woman tried to mess me over, but there, there were still some things that had to be dealt with. And I had to stand up for myself. Um, and I got married a third time and people said, get a prenup, do this, do that. You know what? If women can change when they go through divorce, I get it. Um, I, I've often said women's math skills go to hell when they go through divorce. 50-50 takes on weird proportions. Um, and, and yeah, men have been, been taken to the cleaners and the court systems do support that in some cases. Um, and the woman I'm with, she's said more than once, you know, if you want me to leave, if I leave, I'll take, I'll, I'll leave with what I brought. And I said, well, no, you're not going to, I'll make sure of that. But 
um, if my woman took everything I've got and left me and just took me for everything I've got, number one, I'd survive. And number two, if I made it once, I can make it again. I, I don't, I don't lose sleep over that. I don't worry about it. Um, so these, these pe people are worrying about shit. Like I can't handle that. I can't handle if it happens. And as we've already talked about, if we're out there living our life based on what we can't handle, guess what we're going to attract, right? Yes. How about if you knew you'd handle it? If, 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 you know, if the court systems jacked you over, what if you knew you can handle it? Okay. And the other piece of this, there's, there's almost this karmic thing. And I've seen it with men and women both. But if you have a fear of being cheated on, of being deceived, whatever, you will either attract people that are cheaters or you will drive a good person to cheat. And I know it. I've seen it from both sides of the equation. People that are afraid of being fucked over tend to drive people to fuck them over. It's, it's just something about your, how you interact with people. If you've got this fear of being fucked over, usually you accuse them of a lot of stuff. You're always snooping. You're always questioning. You don't, you don't take them at the word. You don't believe them. And that shit makes people behave badly. It's, you know, it's, it's karmic in some way. So I'm, I would tell guys, whatever you're afraid of is probably what you're going to attract. So why not invite what you're afraid of. Why not lean into it? Why not say, bring it, let's dance with it. You know, come on, babe, you know, let, let's get all in because I promise you, if you live with a person projecting your fear onto them, I promise you they'll find a way to make your fear come true. It just yeah. happens. Especially women to men, you know, that you keep projecting onto a woman. She feels it so strongly and it's almost like you push them to do it, you know, and I, I've, I've seen that. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, you know, when I've been with women that constantly accuse me, you're going to cheat on me. You're going to cheat on me. I know, I know you got another woman. I know you were talking on the phone. I know you're doing this. You actually get to the point where, you know, I'm not a person that's going to just intentionally go out and cheat on somebody because they've been accusing me of it. But uh, it, it does something to you that after a while, you, you kind of really don't give a fuck. And that's yeah. not a good place to be. And it's not a good numbers. place to drive your partner to. Don't drive them to that kind of numbness. One of two things happens when I hear that from people. Um, I either assume you're right. I get numb. You just don't give a fuck anymore. You like, eh. or the other one is I start to think, well, they're going to do the very thing they talk about. That's why they're bringing it up so much. You know, yeah. you do that I, had, wonder. <laughs> yeah, I had somebody saying, you're going to steal money from me. You're gonna steal, he said it so much. I started to think, wait a minute. And then he ended up stealing $1,700 from me in the end. And I was like, should have saw that coming, you know? Yeah, he, he, he put up a sign, put up a billboard. Yeah. Said, yeah. Brian, I got issues around stealing money. That's right. Um, okay. Uh, I find that I'm either being a Mr. Nice Guy or trying to be Mr. Cool Guy, especially around women, because I think that will give me that smooth, easy life you talk about in your book. My question <laughs> is... is if giving up, I, I love working with men. I, I love the logic we come up with this guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it seems so perfect in the moment. Yeah. 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 Uh, my question is giving up on these personas means giving up on the dream of a perfect life. What's a more realistic alternative and what's the best thing about it? A more realistic alternative. Tell him on giving up his personas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got to give up my personas and my dream of, a, of an unreal world that doesn't exist. Um, yeah, you know, hey, we grow up playing Dungeons and Dragons and playing World of Warcraft and watching, you know, the, the you know, the, the, oh, my mind went blank of the, um, the people living in that underworld. <laughs> the, you know, anyway, we love fantasy. We men love, we, oh, if I could just create my own perfect fantasy world. Um, it's called growing up. We don't live in this smooth, problem-free world. We live in a world where, where you get, you know, tumors in your colon, where you, where you do get cheated on, where women do leave you and take the kids and you got to pay for them. We live in a world like that. All right. Are we going to hide away from it? Are we going to dread it? Are we going to try to make it smooth? Or are we going to dance with it? Or are we going to say, bring it? Again, that's where we need our tribe. We need our men. We need to be challenged. We need initiation to learn to deal with these things that make us uncomfortable. And I promise to the guy answering the question, when I worried about what women thought about me, it kept me a nervous wreck and it kept me always trying to game the system. How can I get her to like me? How can I get her to stay with me? How, how can I get her to want to have sex with me? 
when I quit doing that and just said, what do I want to get up and do today? How do I want to live my life today? All of a sudden, I didn't have to do that anymore. And I wasn't anxious around women or trying to game them. And women were coming out of the woodwork. Like I said, I often wondered what planet had I landed on? You know, women were approaching me. Women were propositioning me. Women were getting naked with me on first and second dates without me even like, hey, is this how dating works now? It didn't work like that when I was a teenager. You know, it's kind of like, because I didn't care. I didn't care. I was living my life on my terms. Freedom from outcome. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I was just getting up every day, living, living the life I wanted to live. And, you know, if a woman happened to come along and be icing on top of that great cake, wonderful. If I didn't have icing, it didn't matter. Yeah. And the other guys are all trying to get into her life. And you're saying, I'm going to have a great life without you. If you, if you want to hop on the ride, feel free. Yeah. yeah. Feel but, free. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just see how it works for both of us. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, I got one more good question. It comes from Anthony, and uh, Anthony's one of my coaches, and I just I like the question. And then we'll talk a little bit about your book. Uh, so, uh, he's got a new book out there. I think you guys should all check it out. I need to read it myself. Um, on the topic of uh, on the topic of triggering abandonment issues, Doctor Glover, what was your first experience setting a hard boundary with a woman, and what type of things did that trigger in you? Oh wow, this about four or five questions in there. So we're talking about my abandonment issues, the woman's abandonment issues, um, her projecting Uh, them onto me, me projecting mine onto her. I'll read this last part. What was your first experience setting a hard boundary with a woman and what type of uh, experience did you have from, what did it trigger in you? What feelings did it trigger in you? What was that like for you to do that? I'll tell, I'll tell a story. I don't know if this is answering the question or not. By the way, everybody, every human being has abandonment issues. Everybody does, because uh, we all had abandonment experiences. We talked about that as, as little kids. Everything is interpreted as abandonment. To a child, abandonment is death. So we all have abandonment fears. It all feels like death. You know, a woman you love leaves you. It feels like death. You don't really die. I think it goes back to our, our it, I won't go too far in where I think it comes from, but it's wired into us to feel like death. Uh, yeah, my, uh, my, I thought my dog was going to die last week. She didn't. She they was, thought she had a tumor, a cancerous tumor. It turned out to be an infection. The vet told me she had a cancerous tumor. You're going to have to put her to sleep for five days. I thought that. And I thought, yeah, if my dog dies, I'll be okay. I've had her for 10 years. Mm-hmm. But within a, after he told me, I was surprised how much it affected me. I was like, yeah. wow, all these emotions came up and for me to yeah. process and work with. And I was like, so hit me a lot harder than I thought it would. You know? <laughs> yeah, we, we've all got it. Um, yeah. One, one of my favorite quotes is from a guy named uh, Dr. David Snarch, who wrote the book Passionate Marriage. He says, in every relationship, somebody's going to get left. That means yeah. even you and your dog. That's life. That's normal. And, and we all fear it. Okay. Uh, kind of the whole Buddhist message is this impermanence that, that you know, everything's going to change. And- That's life. The more we can embrace it, the more we can open up to life, right? Okay, story of setting a boundary around abandonment. Now, I don't know if this is what he was asking, but I like the story. Uh, I was dating a woman, and we'd probably been dating about a couple of months, and, um, and it, was going, it was going well. And uh, the, the, the kind of backstory was, is that prior to her, I'd dated another woman, actually a couple of years before her, and we'd stayed friends, um, but we had, we had good boundaries. And... Um, and we both liked the same musical group. And I'll just say it was Dave Matthews Band. But we never actually went to a show together. Well, Dave Matthews Band plays a three-night outdoor concert series in Washington State every Labor Day weekend. Right? So that's coming up, actually. And, um, and I'd go, you know, camping. And, you know, I, I just loved the whole event of it. Kind of, it was kind of my Burning Man. I've never done Burning Man, but that was my, my way of doing it. So anyway, with this woman, I, I'd gone online because I was a member of the fan club, got tickets. I got two tickets when I was single, had no idea who I was going to take. And I bought two tickets for her. She asked me to buy her two tickets. She was seeing another guy at the time. So when I bought my tickets, I had no idea who I'd take. I then, after I'd bought the tickets, met this woman that I, that I started dating. And about a month in, I asked her if she liked Dave Matthews Band. She said, is this a trick question? And I said, no. <laughs> and she said, well, my ex-boyfriend hated them. And I absolutely loved them. And I didn't tell her at that time, but I waited a little while longer. I said, okay, I got tickets for the weekend. You and I are going camping. So about, about the time this approached, we've been together about two months. And um, so I told her, I said, I've got two tickets. 
that I'm going to deliver to this friend of mine, an ex-girlfriend. I'm going to go meet her. We're going to have a drink. It was a happy after happy hour in the afternoon. I'm going to give her the drinks. And I'm going to come over to your house afterwards. So I got about over to the house about six o'clock. We went for a walk and I mentioned a couple of things about the ex and probably I shouldn't have brought that subject up. Women are sensitive, but I just mentioned, I said, I think she's like settling for the guy she's with or something. Well, whatever it triggered the woman I was dating, but she didn't say anything about it. Right. So, um, so the next day, I don't, I, I, I send a text message and get nothing back. She doesn't call. So we go a day without her responding. So I leaned back, didn't pursue, didn't go into a panic of what, what, what. And then um, the next morning, I think she responded to a message. And I said, what's up with that? I said, you didn't call, didn't return messages. Oh, I left my phone at, yesterday when I went to work, I left my phone at home and I didn't have your number. I said, uh, bullshit, you've called me from work before on the work phone. I said, we need to talk. And she said, you want to talk now? And I said, you're at work, right? And she said, yeah, I'll take a break. So I went to the mall. She worked at the mall. Um, and so I went to the mall. We, she took a break, sat down, and I said, I don't know what's up. But I said, this does not work for me. I said, you know, I don't know what's up with you. And she said, well, it's because you, you know, went and had a drink with your ex. And I said, and? I told you the entire story. Everything I told you was true. I didn't hide anything from you. I came over to your house. Everything was completely in the open. There's nothing there. And I said, you can tell me it bothers you. You could tell me whatever you were feeling. But I said, this thing of you just not calling back or not replying to text messages, that doesn't work for me. And she goes, you're right. You're right. That wasn't a good thing to do. And she said, are you breaking up with me? And I said, I'm seriously considering it. And she said, I don't want you to. And I said, I'm going to have to give it some thought because I, I, I don't go for that. You know, I'm okay if you have stuff. Tell me your stuff. Don't do that pull away stuff. And I said, she said, well, I'd still like to go with you this weekend. And because it was that weekend of the concert and camping. And I said, give me a day to think about it. I'll let you know. And, and I said, but no matter what, you're on probation. I said, you ever do something like this again, we're done. I'm because I won't tolerate that. I saw her in that moment, like fall more in love with me. Like, it's like, I want this man in my life. And we went and had a really fun weekend um, right. and, and then dated her for a few years after that. Um, other issues came up. Um, but that, that was an example that I looked back on and thought, I need to keep that story in my mind because those things were, are going to happen in every relationship. Women are going to test men. Women are going to run their defense mechanisms. They're going to do their shit tests. They're going to pull away. They're going to challenge him. And if a guy can say, say to the woman, that doesn't work for me. If you want to hang out with me, you've got to do it this way. That doesn't work for you. Or you need to have, we need to have a discussion about that. And if men can do that in that clear, powerful way, it invites the woman to be at her best behavior. It invites her into that challenge of a relationship and where she has to grow and, and can't just revert into her little girl, her defense mechanisms. And um, it, it lets the woman know what's required of her if she wants to hang out with this amazing guy. I find that those kind of boundaries turn women on where they go, I, I like that. I, I have one other example similar to that. It was actually with the woman I bought the woman I bought the tickets for. She and I had started dating, hadn't slept together yet. But I took a trip and like didn't hear from her over the weekend. And I got back and said, "How was your weekend? Was well, good." She said, "I said, well, what'd you do?" Well, I hung out with a friend. And I said, "Oh, well, okay." I said, "A guy?" And she goes, "Yeah, ex-boyfriend." I go, "Okay, cool." Yeah, you know, we weren't sleeping together or anything yet. And um, I, I said, uh, "Do you still sleep with him?" And she says. Well, I won't let him, you know, put his penis in my vagina, but we still do some things together. I said, did you this weekend? And I mean, I wasn't drilling her. And she said, uh, yeah. And I said, okay. I said, I, I have no idea, no desire to control you, tell you who to see, who not to see. But I said, but if you want to keep hanging out with me, I'm not going to tell you don't see him. But all I'll ask, if you want to keep hanging out with me, if you want to get deeper with me, no boyfriend, girlfriend type behaviors with him. She goes, okay, let me think about that. And like next time I saw her a few days later said, I got to tell you something. I told a couple of my girlfriends about that boundary you set with me. And she said, both my girlfriends says, that is a good man. You need to get with him. And she goes, I told my ex, I'm never seeing him again. She goes, 
I want to get in deeper with you. I said, let's give it a try. I love that. It's, a be it's beautiful because women, you know, you're the container, you're the picture frame, you're the riverbed, you're the, you're supportive force. And yeah. And they love that stuff, man. They need it. And uh, you talk about it in your book. It's like that whole line when they cross the line and, and they push the guy back and, they, and the guy never sets that line. It says, don't cross this line. Yeah. Somewhere in your book. It's been years since I read it, but I know that's in there somewhere. So. That is there because that was how I learned about boundaries. The first time I learned about them from a therapist I was working with. She put yeah. a line on the ground and she came and pushed me back. And I thought, wow, boundaries. What a novel concept. <laughs> It is a novel concept and it works so well. Um, okay. Uh, I hope I answered the question that was asked of me. Sometimes I'm, I do, sometimes I don't. <laughs> I think he did. I think he did. I think it was a good question. Uh, and I think it's powerful for everybody to hear. Um, did you want to share a little bit about your new book, Dating Essentials? And uh, I know it just came out. Or when did it come out? It, it came out in June. Where you and I are talking in August of 2019. So people watch this five years from now. Anyway, it came out in June. Uh, it's available on Amazon. Uh, initially, it's come out as an ebook. Um, even before it was available for download, uh, Amazon named it a number one new release in two different categories, uh, which so that was cool. Uh, right after that, uh, my agent got a contract for the Audible version of it. So I went back to New York and recorded that. About three oh, weeks your ago. Voice. I love it. With my it's... voice, with my that's voice. Awesome. So uh, I don't think that's available yet in Audible. We're still shopping for a print contract to go with it. But Dating Essentials for Men talks about how I learned to date in my 40s um, after being a historically terrible dater um, and how, how, what I learned and how, how to authentically uh, date, how, how, how to date in ways that build healthy relationships. Um, I, I, I often refer to the book as the, the unpickup guide to dating success. Um, really, how to be real, how to be authentic, how to attract women into your great life, and, and how for you set the tone and take the lead, and, and how to create the kind of life that, that a good woman wants to come be a part of. So uh, then go to Amazon and check out Dating Essentials for Men. They, my, I've got a new website to go with it. Uh, Interestingly enough, datingessentialsformen.com. Um, they can find out about the book. They can find out about other resources I've got for single guys as well. And, and if they want to go to drglover.com, that's where all my classes are, all my podcasts, all my workshops. So uh, either, either way, they can find out all my goodies. Nice. That sounds perfect. And uh, I will be definitely checking it out, my, checking it out myself. Um, and then we've got you coming up in Miami in the beginning of December. Oh, I'm so excited about that. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. We actually uh, are going to have Mark come out too. I just, I, I got to talk to him a little bit more, but I'm, I just got to solidify that it looks like Mark, uh, Mark Edward Davis is going to come out too. And uh, we were just talking two days ago and he sent me a picture of you and him hanging out. And it looked, I was like, oh, you guys really know each other really well. Did he send a picture of, with my family on the beach? Yeah. We were all eating out together. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mark. Mark came and he said, "I'm I'm I'm in Puerto Vallarta." And I said, "Well, come on over to the house. My my wife will make us dinner." So he came over one night. Um, I, I had to slow him down on my margaritas. I make really good margaritas. I said, "Mark, slow down, slow down, slow down." <laughs> he ended up spending the night in our guest bedroom. Nice. Um, so yeah. So that that'd be fun if he was out there. I think so. I think it'll be a lot of fun and uh, having just everybody getting together, having dinner out there. We're, we're at a beautiful hotel, so in a beautiful location. So, so um, that link is, did you already put the link in, uh, Cairo? Okay, there's a link in the chat box. Just go ahead and check it out, guys, for the event. Uh, you can sign up through that link. Come on out, see Dr. Glover is the keynote speaker. What makes this event unique is he's not just gonna speak once, he gets, uh, he gets to speak all three days and he gets to talk with you and he'll be around the event. and. And this allows, um, this allows all of you to, him to really, for me, what it does, it allows me to adjust think a little bit each day to really get you what you need versus yeah. a million different speakers coming up that you, and, and you forget about the first one by the end of the workshop because of the, you know, because so many more have come up. I, it's, we, want, we want you to be able to get some real time with these guys. So. I, I, I love that kind of arrangement. I'm excited. And, and, and we need to tell the guys this as well. It's my birthday. The first day of the conference is on my birthday. So I'm going to come celebrate my birthday with these guys in Miami. Yeah, we have to do something special for Dr. Glover, and we'll figure that out. Because uh, I think birthdays are super important. I've always been a big, mm -hmm. big fan of celebrating people's birthdays. And, uh, and I love having a birthday in Miami with what better way to do it? I'm, it's going to be fun. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, thank you for being on the call, Dr. Glover. And thank uh, you. This was, I had a good time. I, and as you can see, I, I, I love doing this stuff. So that's why I'm so looking forward to Miami and just having, you know, the one-to-one -one group access with the guys that, you know, we can go as deep with this stuff as guys want to go. And I'm the same way. I love, I, I think that's why me and you have succeeded for so many years. I see so many coaches come in the industry and they're just trying to make money. They don't want to go deeper. They don't want to get expand themselves. And every year I want to expand the work. I want to take it deeper. Sure. How, can we, sure. how can we transmute the guys faster? How can we make more powerful men uh, and, and show them the best ways possible to shift their lives? How can we get an integrated man summit? How can we get speakers that really change men's lives versus speakers that are just going to show up and give a talk? And that's, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, and that's why I love your work and uh, I'll always be recommending it. So um i'll see you at the event in december then and, all right uh, and, I've, I've i've already booked my flights i'm ready perfect perfect and uh thank you for being on the call thank you I had a great time okay take care guys have a beautiful day uh should i just click off here the uh the end meeting okay cool so i need to make sure